things that I can answer or do as you're preparing. Yes. Do you have until Friday, like for you to look at all the stuff and then Friday? Yes, so um, because I am giving you all an extension, right, I know last class there's an extension on the essay. Uh, rather than being due this Friday, you can turn it in um, basically a week from today, next Wednesday, on November 24th for full credit. Because of that, you have a bit longer to send along a draft or an outline. So if you can get that to me by Friday, that would be great. Um, you know, at the absolute latest, if I get that by Monday, I can still look at it. But um, the sooner you get that out to me, the sooner I can return feedback. As a reminder, you do not have to send me a rough draft or an outline. Those are just there in order for me to help you um, support your grading the class. Yeah. So it's the 24th, not the 26th? Should be the 24th. Okay. Is that what other folks have? Great. Yeah. So it's next Wednesday, the 24th. Again, I wanted to give you that extra time because I know finding a topic um, can take you know a little bit of time to do, and breaking down that topic um, definitely can take some time as well. Uh, so you're welcome to turn it in as early as Friday, but um, you can just use that additional time if you need to. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns related to this assignment? Awesome. So best of luck as you're continuing to work on this. And again, this doesn't need to be a perfect draft since you'll be sticking with this topic longer and working on expanding it out into your final draft too. So last class, um, we talked about the study circles. We just kind of debrief there while I was mentioning some of the things I think went well and areas to continue to focus on, such as strategies of avoiding groupthink. Talked about the paper. Uh, one thing I should add is this draft is only worth 100 points or 10% of your grade. Uh, since it's a rough draft, right? Um, it's not as high stakes, and that'll give you a lot more to work with as you're gearing up for the final draft. So don't feel quite as stressed about this one as you might on other papers. And then we also talked a little bit about mediation in conflict management, which is a topic that I want us to explore kind of through some examples uh, and a scenario that I'll be giving you a little bit later today to help us understand this issue in greater detail. As a reminder, uh, this Friday's class is attendance optional. It's a chance for you to come in if you've got questions about your essay, if you'd like me to look over your shoulder while you're working on a draft, or you'd just like a place to work. So I'll be here, uh, and you can choose whether or not you'd like to be here, or if it's easier for you to do something else. So um, for some of you, right, this might be our last formal class meeting until Monday the 29th after the break. So for this class, we'll talk about mediation. Um, some of the skills and strategies that we can use in order to be successful mediators, something some of us have already been tasked with doing for the study circles. We'll look at some case studies um, and applications here, and sort of the broader implications that it gives us for public management. So you might think back to Monday when we were breaking down what exactly mediation is and what makes mediation different from other forms of conflict management. It's a few things. The biggest one is that it has a third party, right? It has a different group uh, or person that's involved in the process. And they're the person that's trying to create a discussion and engagement between members of the group. At the end of the day, it's still the people in conflict that are making the decision, right? The mediator is not the decider, but the mediator can help make a decision that otherwise can't be reached, right? Oftentimes, people in negotiation with each other might reach an impasse. They might feel like they're not understanding each other. Good mediators are able to ask questions. They're able to steer the discussion. They're able to provide some level of neutrality and support that allows like a stalled conversation in particular to get going. Oftentimes, mediation is not the first step. It usually happens after a failed negotiation. Now that we've tried it as parties together, it doesn't work. We need to bring somebody else in to deal with this conflict. So mediation is able to steer the ship um, toward a good solution. So um, there's a lot of different examples of how uh, different companies and organizations um, engage in professional mediation. We looked at a couple of them uh, last class. We looked at both kind of indigenous styles of um, dealing with mediation uh, and an emphasis on like larger public and groups and multiple interests. Whereas companies such as the Federal Mediation Service generally focus more on two people involved in a conflict and so on. 
Um, so the US Postal Service, as you read for today, has the redress program, right? Resolve employment disputes, reach equitable solutions swiftly, um, is actually a way that the US Postal Service has taken a really active position on the issue. Um, interestingly, last year, last July, um, they hosted a really big Zoom presentation in which um, they basically did formal training in mediation and dealing with conflict. Um, there's actually a clip of that that's available on YouTube. Uh, it's like a lot of old guys in little Zoom rectangles. Um, but it's kind of fun and interesting to see how organizations like this employ strategies of addressing conflict. This happens because organizations like the Postal Service, as you can probably imagine, deal with a lot of conflicts, like with customers, with the companies that they serve, and so on. And so this mediation strategy has been something that they've developed over the years to deal with this conflict, too. So in addition to those kinds of questions, um, mediators have to deal with a lot of kind of logistical questions. Uh, especially given the conflict can be challenging. And as a mediator, right, you feel a lot of pressure in order to make the mediation go smoothly. For instance, if you're somebody like an RA, right, you feel a lot of that pressure pretty regularly in order to have a good role as a mediator. Right? Good mediation means people come together and make an agreement, oftentimes feel a lot of pride and enjoyment in doing that. Bad mediation means that you're accused of being biased, uh, people are maybe more frustrated than where they started. There's a breakdown in trust. So there's a lot of writing on good mediation. Right? One of the ways that we can ensure mediation, of course, is to ensure safety. Um, so when people are engaged in conflict with each other, you know, ensuring that there's proper safety protocols in place, um, ensuring that there's a way that people are able to deal with issues that come up. Um, you know, safety can be both in terms of verbal as well as, um, you know, physical, right? So sometimes having a security presence is necessary at really heated exchanges. But sometimes verbally, right, that means um, providing appropriate boundaries for conversation. Maybe um, if you're dealing with a very sensitive group, one way of helping is to ask people to provide some type of warning uh, before getting into uh, particularly challenging material, right? So for instance, um, people that might have uh, really close experiences with issues related to self-harm, right? Uh, it's important to check in and let folks know in advance those so issues can be addressed. And then another question, right, is how many people should be in mediation? Western styles say that there's two people, typically, um, or two groups. A lot of non-Western styles look at conflicts involving a lot of different groups. So there's no really easy answer for how many people should be involved. But there should generally be a feeling of openness and equality, right? That um, there aren't more representatives or people from one side of an issue relative to another, or else people might feel that they're being ganged up on. And then another kind of interesting uh, logistical question is where people should be, like physically. Um, and that's actually something that a lot of mediators agonize over. So the idea that people in dispute are like sitting across from each other on the table and have to look at each other, uh, and the mediator is kind of in the back over here, is actually a model that tends to work pretty well, right? The idea being that the mediator is able to create a conversation between the disputing parties amongst each other, that the mediator is not the third party being talked at, but is instead the person helping to guide the conversation between the two. So there's a lot of practical challenges like these that we have to think about when we're looking at successful mediation. I mentioned this a little bit last class, but a key idea here um, in mediation is this idea of the settlement curve. Or in other words, mediation procrastination. And it's this idea that we tend to find more and more agreements as we're bumping up against the deadline, right? Um, so if you've followed any of the national discussion about things like uh, raising the debt limit um, and so on, we know that Congress will typically pass an increase in the amount of debt that we can borrow as soon as we run up against the deadline, right? Or sometimes even after when we've had a situation like government shutdown. And that's because 
we're more likely to reach an agreement as we come closer and closer to the deadline because we want to avoid the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. We want to avoid um, the bad thing that can happen instead. We're more willing to uh, dig our feet in early on because we say, you know what, there's plenty of time for people to cave into or support our side of the issue. Uh, but as we start to get the panic, oh, people's opinions aren't changing. We've got to do something. Then people are more willing to accept the agreements that people have. For instance, right, in following things uh, such as some of the spending and infrastructure bills, right, a lot of the things that get dropped or changed in proposals, um, for instance, issues in the um, previous um, like Recovery Act regarding uh, minimum wage got kind of dropped toward the last minute. Um, and kind of the more recent round of infrastructure and spending, things like rental leave got kind of dropped toward the last minute. Like as you get closer and closer to the deadline, you see more and more concessions and changes happening. So procrastination happens a lot. A caucus um, is one example that we see sometimes. How many folks have heard like of the Iowa caucus before? A couple of you? Yeah, so Iowa is one of the first states that does uh, presidential primaries. And uh, some states, although there's been a lot of changes in recent years, um, will do what's called a caucus, right? And a caucus is this sort of private meeting, um, oftentimes held in like stadiums or spaces like schools, where people will show up and vote or discuss um, which candidate the state is ultimately going to support. So rather than doing like a traditional winner-take-all voting system, the caucus is a specific political party, right, Democratic or Republican party, who is meeting together, right, one party meeting together and collectively uh, reaching the solution about which candidate they choose to support. So, um, we followed the presidential primary uh, last cycle. We know that the Iowa caucus was a disaster, but we also know that uh, a caucus is a way that like one specific group would be mediated. And there's a few different ways that that can happen, right? So, a lot of times, if somebody is like kind of a counselor or providing some type of support in mediation, uh, there might be something like an intake survey where people going into a conflict ahead of time will explain to that person what issues or topics uh, are important to them or they'd like to put out there. So that could be one way that a caucus is being used. It can also be used if there's a challenge that comes up. So for instance, um, maybe one person in the conflict is repeatedly breaking the rules, um, you know, is using personal attacks or insults. You might say, hey, let's take a break. I'd like to talk to you in particular. So it's important to be careful and choosy about how you're using a caucus, because if you're breaking people separately all the time, it creates this kind of smoke and mirrors and uh, perspective that you are taking aside or speaking out to people in a way that could be biased. So if you're ever in a mediation situation, you can single out and talk to a specific group, but you need to be careful. So how many folks have heard about some of the issues surrounding MIRA and logging. A little bit. So this is a new issue that has come up. Um, I know it's had some discussion, but MIRA, right, Mount Emily Recreation Area, that's about 10 minutes away from EOU. It's a lot of places where people go to hike and bike and do outdoor things. Um, there is ongoing discussion and negotiation surrounding whether or not um, there can be logging within the Mount Emily Recreation Area, right? Um, there are questions about how logging would be beneficial for things like timber. It could be helpful in terms of kind of avoiding the risk of fire, right, through things like planting and overall forest health. There are a lot of concerns, right, about its impact on wildlife, um, its impact on kind of the natural beauty of the area. Um, so, right, the Union County Parks Department is kind of putting out and working together with groups such as um, the various timber companies that want to move forward on logging. Uh, but, of course, there's also a lot of public concern, including support or opposition to this issue as well. So that would be an example of mediation in action, right? Something like the Union County Parks Department is serving as a mediator between 
uh, timber companies, as well as the general public or concerned parties surrounding how this logging is going to be used. In fact, we've already seen some things happen through this mediation, including questions about um, where the timber can happen, so like well outside of the boundaries of the various hiking and biking trails, uh, is one area that's kind of been reached as far as negotiation and so on. This is still a very ongoing um, and discussed issue, right? Um, but it's an example of how mediation can serve to try to bridge challenges between disputing parties. So we'll kind of see where that goes. Another example, uh, kind of as a local example, that I know has already become politically charged uh, and extremely heated, right, is um, the, um, the football game, right, between Gladstone and the Grand. Uh, there's a lot of questions surrounding um, whether or not racially charged language was used uh, in reference to a particular student. Right? There's a lot of uh, discussion and disagreement about this topic, but many of the schools, including their kind of uh, superintendents and leaders, are trying to use mediation as a way to understand and listen to each other. So there's a lot of kind of local examples of mediation trying to be used in action. Right? And whether or not we like the outcomes or how we feel about these issues, a mediation serves as a way that we can better understand where people are coming from. So um, there's some skills that I think help us to engage in mediation effectively. So um, these kind of five skills are the general strategies that you can use in mediation. And we can do mediation formally, right? You can have as your career a job that's focused on managing conflict or dealing with mediation in the workplace. But it's also true that we're going to have to take on that role in our lives at some time or another when we least expect it. Whether it's two friends who are arguing with each other, you have to help them kind of mend the fences. Uh, or, you know, you're dealing with a question about who to hire for a job and you're seeking outside help, right? There's so many situations where our ability to serve as this third person to help deal with a conflict or issue um, tends to come about. One of the key ideas here right, is setting an objective or purpose. In other words, what are we hoping to get out of this mediation? What are we hoping to realize? In the mirror case, it might be an understanding of how uh, the Mount Emily Recreation Area land will or will not be used for timber. Second idea here is finding the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. So this could look different depending on the person. Uh, and depending on the group being involved, right? For a lot of people, uh, maybe the worst alternative is that uh, the timber industry has free reign and Mira is pretty decimated. Or uh, for some of the companies, right, the worst alternative would be that that resource cannot be used for logging. So um, finding that option and finding the stakes, the significance of the mediation is really important. In the context of a lot of relationships, right, the use of an ultimatum, uh, if mediation or counseling does not work, I don't think our relationship has a future, uh, is another way that that could be important. Deadline pressure, right, is the idea that as you're coming up, you're saying, you know what, we don't have a whole lot of time, we really need to move ahead, um, you know, we really need to move forward on this. To be an example of how we're able to uh, motivate people. I showed a clip at the beginning of the quarter, right, of the film 12 Angry Men, and as, you know, the jurors in that film are continuing to debate and deliberate about the guilt or innocence of the person on trial, um, they start to get really exasperated. They're exhausted, they want to go home, and so they're way more willing to um, get on board uh, and reach a verdict together because they're starting to feel uh, that accumulated exhaustion. So deadlines can be explicitly given out, but deadlines can also just be the passage of time if people are forced to work together for long periods. Separating demands from problems is another really important thing, right? Demands would be, I, they have to do this. This has to happen, right? So um, they cannot do any sort of timber uh, in Mira would be an example of a demand. A problem might be something like, we're really concerned with the beauty and use of the natural area, 
how can we address this in a way that ensures that that's preserved? And then reframing the issue, right, is thinking about the problem in a different way. So it might be something like, how can we build a good relationship uh, between companies uh, who are interested in natural resources and environmental activists as well? So reframing is a good way to, instead of treating something as a problem with no way out, to treat it in a more positive and constructive way. Another key idea here is crosstalk, right? So crosstalk would be when there's direct conversation between um, people in dispute that are talking to each other rather than talking to the mediators. So that's something that we would ideally see a lot. But crosstalk is definitely a big idea here in terms of how people are able to address issues that might come up for each other. So, one of the really big challenges that comes up in both negotiation and mediation and something for us to really consider when we're thinking about what role mediation plays and how to do mediation effectively is this question of reality. So think back to deconstructing conflict, right? The three things that we identified as the most important tools to deconstruct a conflict they're tangible evidence, so things like videos, documents, reports, that type of thing. There are things such as witness reports, where somebody who is there is sharing what happened. And uh, self-reports, where you, as a person involved in the conflict, are sharing what happened. When we talked about that earlier in the quarter, one thing we came up with the idea of false memory, right? Not every recollection or detail from your past is going to be accurate. If we were told, have you ever had an experience when you were five years old and got lost at the mall? A lot of us would say yes, even though that didn't happen. So false memory is a common practice, and we can strategically make false memories too. We can say, oh, this happened, or you said this during mediation, even though it never happened, right? So our memory can be wrong, and we could intentionally use deception as a way to say that mediation went differently than it did. So whenever you find yourself in a situation like this one, it's incredibly important for you to find a way to make as clear and documented as possible what happened in mediation. One example that you can do, um, if you're a mediator in particular, is taking minutes. So by taking minutes, that means you're taking notes about what happened in your exchange uh, between parties. After that, you ask people to look over the minutes and then you have a consensus where they approve those. So for instance, maybe the logging company says, you know what, um, we would only use this one area for timber, we would never extend beyond that. Mediator says, okay, that's written in the notes, the notes are approved, and then if the timber company said later, oh, well, we never committed to just doing one area, you can refer back to the text in the minutes and say, well, you actually did right? Another thing that can help with this is recording, right? So consenting uh, to something like video or audio recording is a great way to rewind and make sure that what's happening is accurate. And then lastly, another tactic that a mediator can do is from the end of the mediation, provide a summary. What happened in the mediation? Where are we going from here? My understanding from today's mediation was that we were able to come to an agreement on the physical land that could be used for timber land. As a result of this, we can now discuss things such as timeline. Is this everybody's understanding? People can say yes or no. So, in other words, as a mediator, right, um, people will get mad at you if it feels like you're not able to establish clarity on what happened during the mediation. One way to be a really good mediator is to ensure that everybody has a really clear understanding of what agreements were and were not reached, and that that solution can be seen textually. Sometimes the mediator is creating discussion, not necessarily a solution right away. The key idea, and the reason this class is called conflict management, not conflict resolution, is that a lot of conflicts can be ongoing. We don't necessarily have a solution right away, um, so maybe we don't reach a solution the first time. So using something like a Google Doc is a really good 
using something like uh, a Google Doc is a really good example of uh, how we can address uh, mediation too, right? So um, again, if you've ever served in something like Model United Nations, or actually United Nations uh, have, does something similar, they'll create this kind of running document of something like a resolution or a proposal and so on. And what will happen is that over the course of the negotiation, that document gets modified, gets updated, gets changed, and so on, uh, such that there's a stable piece of text that everybody's working from. That can be another really good way uh, that mediation can work. Let's create a Google Doc. I'll help guide this document to store out your categories. Now, let's work together on this issue, then this issue, then this issue. For instance, if you were doing like a more formal mediation on uh, different forms of energy, how we source our energy, right, you might use that to break up the categories. So another key idea here um, are standards of conduct. That is, how you as a mediator or a person involved in mediation should behave. So there's a few things that we can understand as kind of these best practices and considerations that mediators should have. One of them is this idea of self-determination. That in a mediation, the group members need to feel like they can participate as people. Uh, that they can share their ideas, their concerns, and so on. One of the key concerns brought up in groupthink is the idea of self-censorship. That people cannot directly share their concerns because they don't want to upset the group. So you want to create a space where people are free to share the issues that come to mind. Another key idea, again, is impartiality. So even in non-Western cultures, right, even though somebody's an insider, they know about the culture of the group, there's still somebody that is uh, an outsider in that they um, don't have as much of a personal stake in the conflict or bias going in. Conflict of interest is a big problem. So if you're somebody that is like, um, you know, personally paying off or good friends with somebody in conflict, that would be an issue. If, for instance, um, one of the people at the Union County Parks Department was taking money from the timber company, that would raise a lot of concerns about its ability to conduct successful mediation. For instance, one thing that some people do in mediation helps a lot. One way that you could consider if you're ever faced with a conflict um, Dealing with mediation would be to say, hey, I'm going to declare that I have no conflicts of interest here. Here is why I'm kind of on the outside and don't know much about this issue. Competence is important, right? That you show that you understand and that you're engaging in the issue. And so, um, right, if I, I used to watch the TV show Arrested Development, and there was this lawyer character who was like completely incompetent. One thing he'd always do is like go in and think that he was talking about a completely different case. So he's like, you know, when do we get out of prison? And we're like, what? What if this isn't a case about going to prison? So being competent shows that you're prepared, you understand the topic. Uh, an easy way to do this is to start by paraphrasing the ideas uh, that people in conflict might be having with each other. I understand that you're interested in using some of the Mira land in order to engage in logging. Is that correct? That shows that you've done your homework and will help people more easily address the issue at hand. Because if you spend the whole time just kind of um, getting information and context from the different groups, you're not going to get very far in negotiation. Right? If you're asking questions all the time as a mediator without doing the upfront research, then it's going to feel like there isn't that much space for the mediation to happen that most of the space is about informing you. Confidentiality, so some types of mediation are more public, are more visible, right? Um, other types of uh, conflict are gonna be ones that are asked to be behind closed doors. A challenge as a mediator is to explain the ways in which you're going to keep your mediation appropriate to what other people agree to. So if it is com uh, completely private, you might have something like a confidentiality agreement or share the ways that you will or will not talk about the issue. And then lastly, uh, quality of the process, it got a little cut off, but ensuring that the members of the group uh, feel like they can be included and involved. That the mediation goes well and that you're able to succinctly and clearly address the different issues. 
So those are kind of some best practices to consider. So what I want to do now, uh, with time that we have left in the class, is I'm going to give you a scenario. And I'm going to ask you to think about how you, as a mediator on this issue, might be able to engage on this topic constructively. So, um, as far as this activity goes, you can either work on this alone, or you can work with a small group. I'm going to ask that each person or group um, is able to write or uh, type for each person in that group or um, individually. So, um, in other words, uh, one per group. So you are a resident assistant or an RA. Uh, some of you might already be an RA. So you're an RA on campus at EOU. Student A has filed a noise complaint saying that student B hosts loud parties at them. But student B denies this and says that their social gatherings are reasonably quiet. So these two students have this disagreement over a noise complaint and are coming to you. Um, you can also assume in this example that you have not directly heard um, the noise that's been going on. So as a mediator in this scenario, what I want you to do either alone or in your groups is to address the following. First of all, how would you choose to organize mediation between these two students? What would you do? So you could think back and use the physical space, the way mediation is being organized, and so on. How do you create mediation between these two? Second of all, what skills should you display in order to be a good mediator? Right? What are the things that you can do in order to do mediation effectively? And then lastly, what standards of conduct do you need to uphold? So what are the things that uh, kind of ethically and socially are important for you to do in this situation? So again, I'll let you either work alone or work in a small group. I'll give you some time to work together on this, and then we'll chat about this together. Depending on your experience, may or may not have been something that's happened before. Um, so I'd like to start with this first question, and either you, if you were working alone, or your group is welcome to take a stab at it. So this first question, how would you choose to organize mediation between these two students? Uh, what were some of the ways that people thought this might be organized? Yeah? Uh, like, uh, Sure. What would go into like a controlled environment? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So something like an office could be really good, right? Because somewhere outside of the dorms and outside of like the situation where the conflict happens could be a really important place to like set up um, conflict management, right? An office could be really good. Uh, an office gives a lot of power to a mediator, right? It's sort of a come to my office. Or if you think about like growing up, going to the principal's office, right? That was something that oftentimes could be intimidating. So self-disclosure can play a big role there. I'm curious to hear from other folks. What are some of the ways that you can organize this mediation? Things like physical environment, setting up a meeting. Uh, one thing we, I mean, we had a lot of things in space, but one thing we talked about was like having it so they're both facing the mediator instead yeah. of each other in case there's like some sort of like uh, other disagreement between them. Yeah. Because we don't know if this is actually like people we found like that. So yeah. And yeah. Yeah, one way to help with that, right, is you might be surveying and trying to gain context on the conflict ahead of time. Um, so doing something like a survey or reaching out to individuals and saying you know each other, you have other issues, what is your overall relationship? So those elements can help a lot. What, how about skills? What are some skills that you need in order to be a good mediator? Go for it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I, I wasn't sure if you had anything to add or if that was the, Okay, yeah. So listening to and understanding the perspectives of different parties for sure. How about uh, somebody on this side of the group? Yeah. Um, I think it would be important for the RA to also know like, the rules and regulations of the board. Yes. Um, so that you could probably discuss that at the beginning, just so that it's kind of fresh. 
Yeah, so overall dorm policy is a really good starting point too. These are the laws or rules that we need to follow. And then standards of conduct. So what standards or practices do you need to do as a mediator? Um, so let's hear maybe from another person around this side here in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, right? So confidentiality matters a lot, especially in a dorm where other people might feel implicated by the conflict. Uh, in particular, right, somebody doesn't want to be the snitch or the person that identified that this noise issue was happening or feel implicated uh, by, like, participating in the noise without realizing it was a problem. So that's really important there. What other things should somebody do to be an ethical mediator? Any other ideas? <laughs> we said like uh game partiality. Yeah. Yeah. Don't choose the side, and I think we already kind of alluded to it with previous comments, being competent in knowing what's going on, what the rules are, and um, enough context to feel like you can do a good job here. Are some of the ways that you could go about addressing this for sure. Mediation is complicated, right? There's a lot of these different parts of play that you really have to think about as we're thinking about the pressure that is involved in this process. So to wrap up for today, we talked about some of these different ways that mediation can involve the skills, the strategies, and the best conduct or appropriate ways that you can be a mediator with other people. And we've also talked about some of the challenges of doing things like recording, having a shared document, or an agreement between group members that can help to avoid, you know, like a he said, she said type of situation. As a reminder, uh, next class is optional attendance. You can come in for workshopping, uh, answering questions, and so on regarding your essay. Turn this essay in next Wednesday on November 24th. And our next full class meeting will be right after break on November 29th. So if I don't see you again, have a great and safe holiday break. Please pass forward uh, your attendance activity to, for today if you wrote it out. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your week.